Hello, I'm Michelle Leonard from the Property Litigation Team at Brown Jacobson. This series of short training videos are aimed at estates teams and surveyors. This session deals with arguments which can be raised in response to a landlord's schedule of dilapidations. What should a tenant initially consider on receipt of a schedule of dilapidations? Firstly, has the landlord complied with the pre-action protocol for dilapidations? This is discussed in detail in a separate podcast. If the landlord has failed to comply with the pre-action protocol, the tenant should consider whether it would be advantageous for it to draw attention to it. If the landlord has served the schedule under cover of a notice, the validity of the notice should be checked. If the schedule has been served during the term of the lease, the landlord may have served it under cover of a Section 146 notice or a notice to repair pursuant to a Jervis and Harris clause. The tenant may be able to benefit from certain statutory provisions that provide procedural safeguards to tenants. For example, where the Leasehold Property Repairs Act 1938 applies, as the lease was granted for a term of seven years or more and has at least three years left to run, the tenant may serve a counter notice claiming the benefit of the 1938 Act. If it does, the landlord cannot proceed to forfeit the lease without leave of the court and leave will only be granted on the grounds specified in the 1938 Act. Section 146 subsection 2 of the Law of Property Act 1925 allows the tenant to apply for relief from forfeiture. Although the court has a wide discretion as to the terms on which relief is granted, it will normally require the tenant to do the repairs as a condition of obtaining relief. Section 147 of the Law of Property Act 1925 can relieve a tenant from liability for internal decorative repairs if the landlord's requirement is unreasonable. Under Section 18 subsection 1 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927, the Court will take into account what the landlord's intentions for the premises were at the expiry of the lease. Therefore, a tenant may be able to successfully challenge the schedule of dilapidations if it can show that the landlord had planned to demolish the premises on the termination of the lease, despite a later change of heart. This is discussed in greater detail in a separate podcast. Turning now to look at the schedule itself, every item on a schedule of dilapidations is a separate claim, and therefore it is important to address each item individually. When reviewing each item, the tenant should consider some of the following points. Is the item within the physical extent of the tenant's obligations? Does the item actually fall within the definition of premises which are demised to the tenant? Particular care should be taken to establish this, where the tenant's demise consists of only part of a building. Is the item claimed in disrepair? Before an obligation to repair can arise, the property must be in disrepair. This means that the physical condition of the property must have deteriorated. It is a question of fact and degree in each case whether the works detailed in the schedule constitute repair. Is what the tenant is being asked to do repair, or would the proposed works result in the tenant giving back to the landlord a property which is said to be wholly different from that demised? In assessing whether the proposed works go beyond repair, a tenant should look at the particular building in question, the state it was in at the date of the lease, the terms of the lease, and then conclude whether, on a fair interpretation of those terms, the works can fairly be termed as repairs. For example, in the case of Lister and Lane, a house which had been built on a timber platform on boggy soil suffered from a bulging wall and had to be pulled down. The tenant was not liable for rebuilding the property. The only way to repair the wall would have been to rebuild the house, which went beyond the tenant's repairing obligations. However, in another case, the replacement of corroded, metal-framed, single-glazed windows with double-glazed windows was within the tenant's repairing covenant. The change in design was ancillary to rectifying the damage. Are the works in the schedule repair or improvements? In some cases, it will be unclear whether the proposed works are repairs or improvements. In the case of Gibson Investments Limited and Chesterton PLC, the High Court held that in relation to an air conditioning system, where works are to remedy disrepair, but also create something which is recognisably different from what would have resulted if the disrepair had merely been remedied, and the works increase the letting value, the difference constitutes an improvement. Removal of alterations and reinstatement. Is there an express obligation in the lease to remove alterations and the tenant's fixtures, and to reinstate? The tenant's obligations in the lease and any licences should be checked together with the yielding up provisions in the lease. 
The lease may require the landlord to serve notice on the tenant, requiring it to reinstate the premises at the expiry of the term. Some leases specify a particular deadline for serving reinstatement notices to give the tenant sufficient time in advance of the lease expiry to carry out any necessary works. Usually, a lease or licence for alterations will require the landlord to serve notice to reinstate on the tenant, although some leases do require a tenant to reinstate unless the landlord notifies the tenant otherwise. What about unlawful alterations the tenant may have carried out? A claim in respect of a breach that occurred more than six years ago will be time barred under Section 5 of the Limitation Act 1980 unless either 1. The lease was made under seal, in which case the limitation period will be 12 years, pursuant to Section 80 of the Limitation Act 1980, or 2. The breach was not known about by the landlord at the time and proceedings were instituted within three years of the date of the knowledge subject to a 15-year maximum, pursuant to Section 14A of the Limitation Act. Can provisions relating to the tenant's fixtures and fittings be included in the schedule of dilapidations? The answer will very much depend upon the terms of the lease, as they can vary widely on this point. Commonly encountered provisions include, usually in conjunction with express obligations to repair and sometimes to reinstate, the following types of yield-up covenants one requiring the tenant to take out all its fixtures and to make good, one entitling the tenant to take out all its fixtures and make good, one requiring the tenant to leave all its fixtures, one requiring the tenant simply to yield up the premises in good repair, where the premises are defined in a way that excludes fixtures, a yield up covenant which is silent on the question of fixtures, in which case the tenant is entitled but not obliged to remove the tenant's fixtures. However, it should be noted that most leases will expressly address this point. Costs. Does the lease restrict the landlord's ability to recover costs in connection with the preparation and service of the schedule of dilapidations? The terms of the lease should be checked, as some leases provide that such costs are only recoverable if the schedule is served within a number of months of the lease expiring. Who is responsible for inherent defects? An inherent or latent defect is one that is due to a defect in the design or construction of a building, or the materials used, which existed on completion of the building works, but was not apparent on inspection. If an inherent defect does not cause damage to a property, a tenant will not be required to remedy the defect under the repairing covenant. However, if the inherent defect causes damage to a property, the tenant will be required to repair the damage. Caps on repairing liability. The tenant's liability to repair may be capped if 1. There is a schedule of condition limiting the tenant's repairing obligations. 2. The express covenants in the lease exclude some or all of the following. Fair wear and tear, insurable risks and inherent defects. Thirdly, Section 18, Subsection 1 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927, which is discussed in a separate podcast. When should a tenant start thinking about dilapidations and its liabilities? The answer to this is as early as possible. A survey which is carried out prior to entering into a lease or taking an assignment or a subletting will establish the condition of the premises and will provide an indication of any works that may be needed, both immediately and later on in the term. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you found it useful. Details of our other podcasts can be found on our website bjretaillaw.com